Hello my friends, I hope you're doing well today and welcome for this new session. First session on Monday because I'm trying out new things. Uh, Monday might be better for me than Tuesday, so let's try Monday. Same hour, same awesome people. Thank you for being here. I hope you're all doing well. And in this episode, we're still we're still working on this one. I'm gonna actually work on uh, the second layer on this portrait, and I have uh, things to change in the the clothing. So I'm gonna be doing this today while we talk, as we usually do, and discuss our usual um, like the the topic of today is going to be. Um, you know more the the how to become an, a full-time artist like basically how how can you become professional if it's what you want to do why would you want to do that uh, is it something you should do um, and I'll just talk about how I how I did this myself and if you have questions uh, we can uh, cover them obviously and um, yeah, so feel free to ask. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna start uh, the painting. And before I start the discussion, I'm gonna just say hi. Hello, Damien, Rocker, um, Stefan, Jack, uh, Rhea, Eric, Marin, Ramuni, Imad, uh, Cats Gallery, Felicia. Everything is okay, yeah. I'm doing it on Monday because I have... Um, I'm going to try um, playing badminton on Tuesday. <laughs> so, uh, don't ask me why. This is just a badminton like club next to where I live. So, I figured, well, let's do this. But it's the same time that I usually do the live stream, so... One PM in Colorado. Hello, Logan. Hello, Drusilla. All right. So uh, on this one, uh, I was not satisfied with the, the 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 dress, so I need to re remodel it. Uh, real quick before we start, make sure you leave a like because it really helps me. You wouldn't believe how much it helps it's like kind of telling YouTube that this live stream is awesome and we want to see more and uh, yeah it supports the stream bonsoir Jasmine <laughs> oh no the puns the puns are no I, I can't stand for the puns like these I'm sorry I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, Emo. How is Norway doing? Okay, so uh, yeah, the dress first or the face because uh, basically this was just the, the first layer. So it's just one coat and uh, the problem is that I don't have a model for the dress so I'm gonna start with the face let's do that start with the face so just the idea just to show you before I start is to just reunify with her and her and create more unity actually they're all going to tend more towards this kind of lighting and this one as you can see it's not working properly with the rest so that's what I'm gonna do. Okay. So right now it's just going to be polishing. All right, so let's start with the the discussion. The the painting itself is not gonna have like tremendous, tremendously interesting elements to talk about. So we can discuss. Um, the subject of uh, becoming a full-time artist, just 
just so that I know basically um, if anybody here is full-time or maybe part-time artist like the sort of like if making art is part of uh, how you make a living just let me know let me know your strategy let me know your approach your philosophy how you see things uh, because it's very interesting you know because i think there is not not just one way like a lot of people they think um yeah i'm not gonna become a professional artist because i didn't go to art school first of all i didn't go to art school but that's one way the, the one way is generally you go to an art school and then you just um, become a professional artist. But you, it's not as easy as, as it sounds because actually most of the time going to an art school, the only thing that's guaranteed when you leave art school is if you can manage to have a, a job in the same art school, which is actually what a lot of like people actually end up doing is like they become artists and and they teach in their art school at the same time so generally it's because you have already have kind of a network the art school in itself can provide you with elements that will allow you to make a, create a nice network that will allow you to work as a professional artist like and sell your paintings it can give you some you know some elements that will help you but it's not a guarantee they don't provide you with everything you need so basically after art school you're on your own right so going to an art school is not a guarantee that you can make it so you, you, if you started with the idea of, yeah, it's too late, I didn't go to art school, so it's not something that I can do, it, it's not a guarantee. Like a lot of people go to art school and then they don't necessarily become artists afterwards. So, or they work on something less, you know, they find a job that's related to creativity in a way, like graphic design, something like that. But they don't like become a painter. When I'm thinking about becoming full-time artist, I'm thinking full-time kind of painter, making paintings, making art, selling art, basically. But you have to consider the fact that the, pos the possibility of doing something related not necessarily exactly what you intended at first, but still fun and enjoyable. And next, also one of the key things when talking about becoming a full-time artist is, do you really need it? Do you really need to do that? Because like overall, there is no need to be a professional to make art. And make good art actually and some of the most famous artists were not necessarily all professionals like some of them had a an outside job to pay the bills so you don't necessarily um, like historically most of the most famous paintings obviously were painted by professional artists but the frontier between doing art for just for the love of art and love and art for um, to make a living is pretty pretty thin so don't consider that it's a necessity that's one thing like the, the main thing that whether you want to become a full-time artist or not the main thing is first to make the art and that's one thing that a lot of um, a lot of people forget like, the, the art needs to be made before you can claim anything and a lot of the time it's just the label but like there is not such a big difference between how many paintings can go out of the studio of a professional or a non-professional a lot of artists 
who do shows and are exhibited in galleries and all, they still have a, what you can call this, a, a, a day job, a side job. And there is absolutely no shame in that because the probability of selling your art and making a decent living out of your sales only, this probability, unfortunately, it's pretty limited. So this is one thing you have to be aware of. Um, wait, you were classically trained. I was classically trained on drawing because I didn't have the money to go to the entire atelier. <laughs> so I couldn't afford to do that. So I basically, I'm, I just went there for uh, the six months that I could afford. So I didn't technically go to art school like properly. I didn't follow the entire thing if, you, if it's the question. So yeah, thinking about that because of the, the question of Jasmine, um, I think about buying your course online because I'm self-taught and I have a lot of lags to stop me in my progression. So with, yeah, that's the thing about art school is nowadays it's, it's just insane. The amount of knowledge that you can find that, that you can do by yourself online it's crazy um you can learn pretty much anything and go from complete beginner to almost professional with just online and if you're if you have the discipline that allows you to be a a, a very dedicated self-taught artist if you have the motivation if you know why you're doing it and to do that very seriously well there is a yeah there is nothing you can't do that's one thing oh no. I'm trying to reset the mic sorry okay better so yeah online classes R right now we are so lucky to live in this like in this uh, age with so much information let's not let the internet be only cat memes and fake news and just there is so much knowledge it's like an open library with everything that you can pick up and collect the only difference though is you will not have a tutor if you choose to go the self-taught way you will not have a tutor you will be on your own and like for some people I know that it can be very difficult this way because you, you never have like uh, concrete feedback it's all always very abstract and you have to be extremely disciplined also extremely hard with yourself which yeah it's not for everyone let's just say that um, yeah, but it is possible. Yeah, it is possible. And uh, and you can make uh, make just paintings in your life. And that's uh, a possibility. So how do you get there though? However, however you proceed to learn, let's say that you have learned Let's say that you have all the knowledge that you need, that you know how to paint. You have found your style. I'm going to skip all these phases because these take years. So take this in consideration. But this phase, it takes a very long time. So be patient, be very patient. But how do you get there to the point where once you have learned all the things you needed, art school or not, how do you make paintings for a living? Well, I would consider first, what I would say is don't. Don't give this, don't, don't try to make this your 
life goal. Your life goal should be make paintings every day and not make paintings for a living. And if you, if you, if you don't feel the nuance, I mean, you really have to first understand exactly the nuances. Technically, if none of your paintings ever sell for any amount, would you still make it or not? If the answer is yes, then go for it and become a full-time or give this, make this your life goal. If you think, well, if I, I'm just there because I need to sell the paintings, no, because you're going to end up making something that's going to be stressing you out all the time and it will, it will not be sustainable and will just be too difficult. You need to have a, 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 an artistic goal that says that whether or not this sells, it doesn't matter. You're gonna make art anyhow. And once you have this mindset, then you can start strategizing to get there. That's the thing and be very, do that very progressively. Super progressively, because it's a very slow process. It's full of hurdles. It's full of unpredictable, unpredictable results. Setbacks are always, um, always a threat. So make sure that you don't Burn your bridge too, too soon without like thinking deeply about it. And come up with a strategy to... You need to come up with a strategy for the, 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 the intermediate period of time during which you're not gonna have enough sales, enough painting sales to make a living, but you're still going to need to produce the paintings, otherwise you will never have anything to show ever, so you still need to make the paintings while they are not selling. That's the idea. And um, yeah, so you have to find something to complement. You need to find a, a, a way to just pay the bills, pay the paint, pay for the brushes while you're making this your life goal. And just very slowly try to have a several, a, um, like a, a strategy with several steps, several stepping stones and milestones, maybe milestone is better. Try to have milestones in your journey. So maybe first try to find if you can just take your job half time, or if you can't just try to dedicate like a, a moment of your time each day and then slowly increase and try to sell and, and see the possibility, feel the possibility of making just that as a, for, for a living before you jump. <laughs> just test the water first. So try, start selling, start actually working on your business strategy, your marketing, try learning all this, like the boring stuff that we artists, we generally don't necessarily find fascinating, but still, that's how you sell paintings, by being a good salesman. Selling a painting is not about making great art, unfortunately. It's about being a good salesman, finding the right buyer, finding the how to reach your audience and all. Or finding your gallery. We're going to talk about galleries, but are they absolutely necessary? No. 
start without a gallery first. So you need to first show your art. You don't need to wait for a gallery to sell art. You need to, to start and be independent. And if a gallery that you want to work with is interested, then you can start or you can start going to gallery and talking business once you are ready and once you have a little bit of experience first-hand experience of reaching to a public making a sale and all So yeah, this is the idea. And um, what else? So yeah, have a think about progressively. So making art like first ten percent your ten percent of of your revenue comes from your art, then twenty percent, then thirty percent, and then progressively increase this until you can finally, but it can be 10 years down the line, finally say, well, okay, now I'm an artist, 100%. And never forget that a lot of artists, even I, I couldn't just survive out of just my art. So when I'm saying that I'm a professional artist, it's, it's true, I am only making paintings for a living, but my sales alone would not be enough. So I need to have like this YouTube channel that brings a little a nice compliment, the, the courses that I sell, the Patreon, people support me on Patreon. So this all comes into, into play and also the more independent you are from your sales and the more the more true and honest your art can be because if you don't have to worry technically about if the the painting is going to sell or not it makes the art much better because well more unique more authentic at least in terms of artistic drive you know what's considered reasonable percent for from a gallery well it all depends on what they do for you um, you have two types of gallery like the gallery that that sort of makes the money from the artwork from selling the artwork and the gallery that makes the their money from the artists like having artists pay sort of participation fees it's called vanity gallery so i would say don't work with a vanity gallery or something disguised as a vanity gallery like like some type of art show or a call, you know, call for artists where you have like expensive fees. If if it's if they are not providing you proof that they are going to actively try to sell your art, then you you don't have to pay generally. So they take a cut. They take a big big chunk of your money. <laughs> they like it can can go from. 30% to 50% some some take more yeah 50% is usually like in Paris it's what is like the, the most common type of um, type of percentage it's hard to find a gallery in Paris with less than that takes less maybe there are not sure So technically, what, what the strategy of this this gallery is? 
okay we take 50% but you're going to sell it for more than twice the amount that you would do on your own because we have like we are a legitimate actor and we can just sort of guarantee um, a high price because the, the buyer is not going to pay I don't know 10,000 for a painting directly through the artist so this sort of work as a an intermediate a third part here that that allows the price of the of the art to inflate so this this huge cut that they make the idea is that well sure they take a huge cut but you also sell for a lot more so that's the that's the the reasoning behind it but even or not i mean that's how it worked for like a long time i don't know this might actually change from from kind of the echoes of the art world that I've heard, it's like galleries are struggling more and more, like all businesses, like all Main Street businesses, they struggle to just function. And maybe the art market will, will move to, um, to the online sphere, or maybe it will just change transform itself because I, I'm not I'm pretty sure that these people are not going anywhere a lot, a lot of people are working in this field so I don't know how they're going to move maybe this will be more you know like pop-up shows where it means that the gallery doesn't have a place like they don't have rent they don't have a store they just sort of uh, they sort of just rent a place for a, a what they call a pop-up and then they just sell as much as they can and the rest of the time they just sell directly or they sell um, they sell online so this can be also a good um, I don't know how it's going to transform but I am from what I've heard, like it's like all stores basically, it's uh, it's they're struggling. So don't put all your faith in a gallery if if it's the it's difficult to find a gallery that will accept you maybe because what you do and for you because the prices they ask to exhibit your work too yeah it's difficult to find a gallery because you have to be in line with the the, the gallery how it's functioning uh, the other artists that they have this needs to be coherent so um, yeah it's it's tricky it's tricky you need to find some someone that you can trust because basically <laughs> you're just giving them or you're you're leaving them their your art like your babies you're leaving this in their hands and they are in charge of selling this but i mean there are there has been some some um some problems in the past between artists and galleries like bad actors doing like like screwing artists basically so it's always a possibility it's always very hard so yeah it's not not always um, always easy which is why the, the the actual honest gallerists that actually do a good job they can say they can justify the, the the percentage that they take by saying that like it's it's 100 percent safe so you won't get screwed they take a big a big um, a, a sizable cut but at least it's um it's safe money with you know you will will not have any problem 
with taxes and stuff like you won't have any blowback that's one of the arguments I don't recommend to have an exclusive contract yeah with a gallery yeah it's generally better if you can just just really you need to agree with the terms if you have an exclusive contract it means that they really sell everything but they they can only pretend to sell whatever you are exhibiting at their in their gallery so nothing more they don't have any they shouldn't be they shouldn't try to pretend to own everything you, you you make basically so if you want to change gallery if you want to have what they would usually do is just say all right so we are in this street or in this city you're just not allowed to have a, another gallery like we, we, you don't go to the competition it's just it's not a necessarily a contract I know that most galleries in Paris just make this a, a non-written art a non-written kind of deal basically it's like you're not exclusive we are not exclusive but just just don't don't screw us up and go find somewhere someone else but you're still free to like go and look for someone else and just negotiate if you want just don't don't do it behind their back to say to just be honest say okay this other gallery is giving me a better a better deal what do you what do you have to offer in this just always remain independent technically the gallery is just a facilitator but they don't own your art and they don't um, They don't own you and yeah so just always be be in control like just yeah you can just continue even if you have a gallery it's not your representation like your 100% representation unless they really have like a super interesting deal and they really sell very well yeah, they sell your paintings really well and you're totally happy then you can sign an exclusivity contract if you want but what I would suggest is always go visit other galleries just look for what they do look, just go discuss with other, other artists that are in uh, other galleries and just just discuss and if somehow another gallery at some point suggests to you that they can offer you something better just say I'm flattered. I'm gonna talk with um, the people that I'm working that I'm working with currently, and come back to you. And this way, you can negotiate to find the best way between not screwing over the people that work with you and and still being free from being free and independent. But if you if you really think about it, even like the most uh, famous artists, they don't have like exclusivity. They generally have like several galleries. It's like it's still something you can do. It's just don't go to the gallery next door. <laughs> it's just that generally, it's mostly the location, the city. The, neighborhood you don't don't find the competition in the same neighborhood and just go to two galleries but other than that you're always free oh yeah that's a good that's also a good idea a lot of I'm not gonna say a lot of people do it but some artists do it and they are pretty happy um, if I become a professional artist, I will do my best to get my own gallery, even though it's a small one, like a home gallery or a gallery in your neighborhood, in your village, in your town. That can be um, a great way to 
to um, to stay independent uh, absolutely and I think like a lot of you a lot of artists yeah no, no like I said not uh, not necessarily a lot but some artists do it and you see that they really enjoy the independence that it brings so it's a good good in between option between having a gallery or being fully like without any anything without any gallery at all like you have this in between option and the good thing is also you can if it's like your own basically it's your own store it's your own little store so you can do everything in there uh, you can use it as a gallery you can use it as a place where you can give lessons tutoring you can also like sell other things i don't know like if you'd make jewelry you can have a jewelry stand uh, it's pretty it's a pretty cool um, concept and i think a lot of artists that do that it's, it's still tough because like it's just like having a store having your own business is always is always a difficult thing that some artists are really afraid of doing it's not like in our nature to do this kind of entrepreneurial uh, stuff but yeah and definitely this one of my long-term dream is getting a, a place where I can have a like make organized residencies, invite other artists, make some sort of a, a cultural place. That would be awesome. I would really love to have this like long term when I have uh, enough savings or or if I sell one of my paintings for millions, who knows? I would love to have like, you know, this place next to where I live where I can have like, like make it a, a, an art, Heaven, <laughs> heaven. That would be um, the dream. And teaching is also a good thing, sharing what you know with others and your love about art making and you to learn a lot with your students. And absolutely, and it's been like in the, I want to say in the genes of artists since the, since at least the Renaissance for sure, more even, even more in the Middle Ages maybe. Uh, like artists naturally share and teach like Leonardo da Vinci had students like d disciples they were not only learning from him he was they were working for him um, this was the atelier like the studio like the studio was not the artist alone like this is more a modern thing like the artists working alone in their studio it's more kind of a lone, uh, a more a modern take. The reality is that artists in the past had very busy studios with like dozens of um, of disciples who were just not. They were not just grinding paint and and preparing uh, the, the brushes for the master. But they were also like taught how to progressively become more and more independent artists until they were skilled enough to become masters themselves and get their own studio and repeat the cycle and this is how art was taught there was there were no art school back then so this idea of being an artist surrounded with people who learn from you and work with you um, and then go ahead and work for themselves and pass the torch is, is very um, 
is a great model i've always loved i this is how i how i would personally have loved to learn like i would have loved to do that but instead of going to an art school the bottega system i don't know about the bottega it's just called atelier system I know you said you were not a fan of the daggers, but Rosemary Delivery just came in and I'm a bit excited. Yeah, let me know how they work when you use them. I, I'm not a fan personally, but it's just, um, I'm pretty sure that they are great. Uh, If you want to make a quick million, just sell a blank canvas. Yeah, I wish it was as easy, but it's a, it's just like the lottery. You need to know the, the right people. You, you and I, my friend, we are not part of the. We are not in the right spheres. We're not in the right circle. <laughs> Yeah, the apprentice system. It's just, well, yeah, the studio system, the apprentice. I don't know how they called this. And it was just, it wasn't just for artists back then as well. It's for, um, it was most jobs were learned this way. And then uh, later in the, I don't know, 17th or 18th century, this is where they came up with the idea of the academy. So basically gathering all the students in the same place so, so that you can control the art more, basically. Like the kingdoms of Europe wanted to have more control over the culture of the art so they had they created the academy where you could you could have a more of a sort of a standard and produce like more prolific artists by sort of mass producing the making it a, a bigger institution whereas the studio was kind of a more of an intimate thing like a couple like 10 students here and there whereas in in a big a academy you can um, teach a lot more students so that was the idea when they came up with the idea of modern modern art school. A good evening, Adnan. Yeah, I know a lot of white paintings sold for a million. But the, the problem is that you need to be like kind of a chosen one for them to decide that it's actually worth millions. I know exactly how to decide that. I don't know who decides exactly what white canvas is better than the, the next one. I don't know, don't ask me. It's 
kind of a game of dupes if you if you want my opinion. I have the daggers from Rosemary, they are okay, but it requires adjusting your brush strokes. Yeah, definitely. It's it's um yeah, it's a special thing. I don't know. I never I never really found them really useful in how I'm using brushes. Maybe because I'm more of a tight painter and I don't do a lot of the maybe I don't know for for a landscape artist would find them I think more useful than me like maybe for the hairs like right now like, like a dagger would be cool maybe let me try to find if I have one hanging around because I do have some let me try to find those daggers sorry for the mic I do have a dagger from Rosemary, by the way. This one, uh, it's kind of... Uh, I had a hard time keeping the shape right, but if you didn't know, this is a dagger. It's pretty sick. Nice shape. So for hair like that, it's good for these these curves and you know create those calligraphy like effects so you can go thick and thin in the same stroke that's which is pretty unique of this shape let me readjust my mic sorry for the yeah pretty unique for this shape it's really a, it's a one of a kind really Depends on whether or not you use it. So let me try to use it actually because it's been, it's been a while. Maybe for the hair, why not? Um, What about the white canvas with it? just a red dot smack dead center? You mean the Japanese flag? Isn't that a white canvas with just a red circle? Or is it even like... Because at least the Japanese flag is... I mean, it looks cool. So see the dagger? The great benefit of the dagger is like you can really change the intensity basically you can go thick and thin at the same time and it's great for these type of curves the problem is i'm not super focused on single strokes personally i'm more getting into the specific so i if i really need to recreate a texture i'm probably going to take a round and re do the texture from a close I'm not necessarily going to rely on you know single strokes but if you really rely on gesture they can really provide you with something unique just a red spot so yeah not even taking the time to think about something original yeah, I know, like these guys, I don't know what they do with their lives. How they, they really think how important their art is, just taking a white canvas. You know, there's a guy also that in the, the city I used to live in, he was like, 
subsidized by the city, like the, the town, the, like, like the city hall, they, they subsidized this guy to like be in a room and every day he would paint a full canvas from a different color. So the first day it was blue and then the next day it was green and then, wow, how original. Never been done before. Yeah, big white canvas with one tiny red dot. Yeah, tell me something. Tell me about something just less boring and just unimaginative. Because basically in 197 in 1917 this this crap had already been all done and experimented basically the dada movement already went all the way and the um the um, malevich and all these guys they already proved everything there was to prove about art the inconsistencies of the art world and all it was already done like the ready-mades were were invented the monochromes they went to the extreme already and so but people still do that again and again still the same unimaginative concepts which is yeah what some of these art schools that we talked about they, this is what they teach actually whereas at least with figurative I'm, I'm gonna try to defend my uh, I'm gonna try to defend my, my my stuff here with figurative art you're still using the same techniques the same process but every new painting is a completely new and different universe because creatively and artistically speaking you can bring something fresh with the same techniques that they used in the Renaissance. Basically, I'm using the same way of painting, it's the same exact type of brushes. Maybe I have some new pigments that they didn't have back then, but for the most part, it's the same. And but I'm I'm still capable of creating something new and different and unique that looks like like the art of my ear i can paint modern people i can i can even have modern subjects represented i can just i don't have to be old school but i'm still using the the, the same timeless techniques principles whereas making the same white monochrome blue monochrome yellow monochrome it's like it's all been done so once it's been done once we get the 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 value of novelty and from there you can just relax and do something else with your life but they keep making them Figurative in art school still is a challenge to defend. Well, it's been erased from most of art schools, so wherever it survives, yeah, definitely it's worth uh, defending because it's been er like in like most mainstream art school in French in France, like figuration has been completely dismissed as sort of old-fashioned and just just not not modern enough so they completely gave up on learning the techniques they learn new stuff like modern stuff but they don't learn traditional painting at all and they sort of trash you if you <laughs> if you have the intention to to learn this kind of stuff just invent a new color. Well, they do that as well. Haven't you heard about the uh, Anish Kapoor that sort of, that 
apparently he invented a cutter for one of his works and he tried to to um, privatize the cutter basically to, to just own the rights to um, I don't, know. I don't remember exactly what he um, what he did. I think there was um, so he made this cutter, and apparently he wanted to to own the cutter. Same thing with uh, Yves Klein, the fa the famous blue by Yves Klein. So basically, he wanted to have this his own unique cutter. He wanted to own make it impossible for others to use it. I don't know, it's just silly. Bonjour, est-ce que l'huile de noix est meilleure que liquine? Liquine. Euh ça dépend, l'huile c'est de l'huile et le liquide c'est un médium alkyde donc c'est pas pareil. Est-ce que c'est meilleur Ça dépend de ce que vous en faire. Uh, Philip, do you have any recommendations for painting if you don't have the money for a canvas? Yeah, just go... Well, if it's really crappy studies and you just want to just want to mess around If you really don't have money Really, but really no money Just go in in a... Just go find like white paint like f wall painting paint and sort of Consider that this is your gesso Like and you can paint on this. It's not gonna be great, but if you really don't have money Just take some MDF panel if you still have a little bit then use artist Quality gesso It's going to be much better But like But normally, um, if you don't have a canvas, you can just find like, you know, any type of flat surface that's, that can be gessoed and apply some gesso and use this instead of uh, an actual canvas. Yeah, I put Nightbot in its place. <laughs> I don't know why it was so crazy with the bands and all. Do you ever use K casein? No, not really. But if you're interested in casein, you definitely need to check out uh, James Gurney. He's the expert in casein. Huh. 
<laughs> yeah, I think Bernard Buffet used his bed sheet as canvas in the beginning. Yeah, if you have linen. Uh, the only problem with bed sheets is like you can't directly gesso them. You have to um, you have to size them first. So you need some. But yeah, if you make modern art, you don't need to gesso anything actually, because it's better if it looks rough and if the oil spills in the fiber of the of the fabric and just just mess it up it's going to look more artistic if you are if you want to do this kind of figurative art that i'm doing then you need to size the canvas and sizing means you need to pour some kind of glutinous material so that the gesso doesn't get into the pores because basically there are holes if you don't on the canvas there are tiny holes and the gesso goes through the holes if you don't have a size do you have experience with the schminke oil colors uh, oil colors uh, never used them but if anyone in chat has experience let uh, Adnan know what you feel about the schminke Uh, bed sheets they they tear not necessarily if you have like the old ones like the OG like the bed sheets of your your grandma like these they are like linen bed sheets like great quality I, I'm using them actually for my um, to clean brushes because they are just scraps but I could technically use these and gesso them actually because it's like linen it's pretty strong and yeah you can size it gesso it's fine grain I mean you can paint on this and but I'm using them for rags but you know I, I use them for rags because when I need to like it, it's more lint free it's more durable and actually uh, these are the rags that I almost never throw away because I just let them dry and you can wash them and repeat the process so it's pretty cool like a good quality linen fabric like this yeah you can gesso this kind of thing they used to do like the good linen fabric back in the days none of this crap that we sleep in now they used to do it good like you had the thing and it was supposed to to last so it, it did last i have some very old you know every time you you go in in the attic in your in your family at your grandma's place or somewhere you always find these and and they are really good like keep them if you can find them don't let them go to waste because they're made for life for more than your lifetime actually You have to apply rabbit skin glue uh, yes but I would you, you can use rabbit skin glue but I would advise not to I would advise to use it in synthetic size like a PVA size because it's overall it's more durable rabbit skin glue it's like very very traditional but it has issues But yeah, technically this is the what we call the size is the rabbit skin glue like the traditional size was the rabbit skin glue but then they
they invented the modern alternative. Find a construction site with a dumpster that may have spare plywood, cut it up, gesso, and good to go for practice. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, for practice, basically anything goes, like you can paint on anything. It's just when, when you start questioning the durability, then, well, in that case, sure, you have to use some high quality more more high quality material but it's just to mess around especially when people are just starting i'm always suggesting yeah, don't don't go for something expensive just gesso anything you can put your hand on that's relatively flat and not porous and that, then just go for it like an old tile i have painted on tiles in the past just to practice um, tiles they work really well like a small you know I don't have one here but it's like usually a very small like tile like this it's great you just have to abrade it send it to help the gesso uh, spread and then it works perfectly <laughs> I had a rabbit pet so I could never use rabbit skin glue. Well, you're right because it's it also stinks. And it's it's vile smell. Bonsoir KB. Yeah, and think about those um, who paint with uh, what they call an encaustic. Encaustic, I don't know how it's pronounced exactly or if it's the same word. It's uh, mostly for, you know, stage, you know, the stage uh, backdrops in theaters and stuff. They generally paint with what's called an encaustic. So basically it's just rabbit skin glue and paint if you use the traditional and yeah it stinks. I don't know how they do it because they make this huge painting with mostly just stinky glue and, and pigments and they have to brush because and they have to dr almost dry brush everything. The good thing is for a stage it's a super matte so it's not um, it doesn't create any problem of reflections and all so for a, a painted background for um, for a theater it works great because it's it's very flat like the, the cutter is flat and then you can ha add the perspective and all but the cutter is flat so it doesn't glare or doesn't have any problem with that because of the pure matteness of the thing but basically it means that they have to dry brush the entire the entire painting with this stinky rabbit glue 
and yeah oh my gosh i don't know how they do that they don't anymore <laughs> i mean some of these traditional you know tradition guys they maintain the the art but most of the, the theaters they don't use this anymore Villa used that technique exactly. How long do you usually take working on a face in oils? It depends on how successful I am at it. Um, can take from I uh, generally for a face I, I always give it like two layers. The first one is kind of you know the Establishing the ground, the main lines, the, the, the proportional. If I'm happy with this one, then I'm going to make the refining layer, which is what I'm doing on this one. And sometimes I'll add details later. So between two and three, generally. Except for faces like really in the background, I generally always do it in several layers uh, I, I'll take my time for most faces and the rest can be much more expeditive I mean I can just for the other t like the, the body I can just be happy with just one layer for for um, objects in the background or the foreground i can be happy with just one layer as well but for the face i'm always trying to have a little bit of refinement because that's just what our eyes are driven to what our eyes always immediately seek so and i, I function the same way in how how much time and care I put in the in the different elements of all the things in a painting the faces are what I just take the most time on I spend the most time on refining or making it look as, as I want Est-ce qu'on peut remplacer la colle de lapin par la gomme arabique Je crois pas, à moins que ce soit pour du papier, mais je dirais que non. <laughs> Thinking about priming my monitor at work with gesso seems like a good surface. Yeah. How about painting the windows opening screen then That's a good subject for your amazing canvas. <laughs> Faces are what scares me the most on the painting. Yeah, this is why you have to relax and just take as much time as you need on faces and not expect to have the perfect the perfect um, face painted on the first go. Like it usually takes several sessions and it's it's not unusual. How do you personally compose a painting? Well, if I knew that, my friend, I don't know. <laughs> it's chaotic. It's chaotic. It's just hard to describe. I just I, I think I don't compose it's like I try something and I see if it works and I do a lot of changes along the way so 
I'm never a hundred percent sure of what I do. Ah bah peut-être, l'encaustique antique était à base de gomme arabique, peut-être, je sais pas. Alors là, je, ça dépasse mon, mon expertise. D'ailleurs, j'ai aucune expertise sur l'encaustique, hein. je, je connais les, les connaissances de base. Hein. Certainement, ouais, Jasmine. Thanks for the question, Niels. What is possible when painting from your imagination? Do you first make a photographic reference? Is it possible to paint a scene from your mind? Well, it's a little bit of both. It's like your imagination is just capable of making kind of, a, you know, photoshopping. It's like your imagination is capable of making a collage of... If you want to stick to a, a realistic style like me, I mean, your imagination can only go so far like your imagination is like kind of the the director but then you still need actors to to play basically the director can't do anything without actors if you treat the if you treat the painting as a, as a movie you're going to find actual models or references because um, there's going to be limitations to what your mind can do on its own or if you go full uh, full imagination with zero reference then you are going to move away from realistic looking paintings which can also be a, a decent choice it's an option available so what I do is generally I try to find references and most of the time I have a video about this I didn't I think the title is um, a technique that I use all the time that I would not recommend or something like that where I talk about how I use my my own self as a, a model for photographic model for my characters and then I change the, the features
Ouais, c'est un peu l'idée, Jasmine. Sauf que pour le coup, ce sera pas une bougie, ce sera une lumière un peu plus rouge. Une sorte de lumière artificielle type euh, l'arrière les, 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 d'une voiture, c'est une, une lumière rouge un peu. Donc, il y aura ça et après des glacis, mais pour le moment, il faut que je préserve ce côté. Euh... When you are painting the ear, should you think of it as hard edges or soft, like the chin? Depends on the case. Uh, some of the edges are hard, but I would say don't waste too much energy on the ear because it's one of the least noticeable areas. Just just focus on the overall size but while well, all the details inside they are not extremely important with regards to the rest so if you want to have to dedicate some brain computing time to to anything in the face just save you the trouble and the ear it's not worth it Yeah, I find it amazing how the old masters could paint those complex scenes without the existence of photography, like the Night Watch, for example. Well, the Night Watch was a commission painting with actual models, so the models actually posed. It's just that he had to make them pose separately, um, probably, and use mannequins for when they were not here. But yeah, well, I'm using photographs because I'm kind of lazy. I talk about why I rarely use actual models. I'm using them like taking advantage of the, the invention of photography to skip the model. But if I didn't have photography, I would use like genuine human beings and ask them to pose for me. But I would like I wouldn't be able to do that right now with you. It would be a different experience. So yeah, definitely photography has affected how I paint, even though I'm using traditional techniques and all. So I often say that I'm using like traditional painting. I'm still doing something completely different from the masters of the past because I do have photography to help me even I, I can have AI if I need as well which is going to be the next step like after photography there's going to be image AI there's going to be as just as big as the invention of photography in my opinion at least that's how I see it Oh yeah, when there is when there are animals like horses, it became tough. Rodin used photography massively in his process. I didn't know that. 
he also used drawing so all the tools that an artist can have at their disposal is going to be used regardless Hi Stefan, I just joined, didn't know there was a live, what did I miss? Um, not much, we've been discussing subjects such as uh, becoming a professional artist, why somebody would want to do it, um, how it can be achieved, like different, different sort of suggestions for people who want to give it a try even though it's not necessary, first of all. And this, this was the, the main discussion and then we have discussed, well, what did we discuss, guys? I don't remember. Um, we discussed rabbit skin glue. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, guys, because I, it made me think um, what Stefan said about he n not knowing that there was a, a, a stream. How did you all, how do you all get notified when I'm live? Do you have like the, how do you, why are, my question is, why are you always there? How do you do that? Because I don't know exactly how YouTube is supposed to let you know when I'm live because for some it will appear in the YouTube homepage some have the the bell for all notifications so it will just uh, there will be a pop-up on the on your phone but I don't know exactly and it's uh, it's complicated because I'm pretty sure that a lot of the the people who watch my videos would probably really like to follow the the lives but they're not necessarily aware that they exist in the first place so I'm wondering how you got notified because this is something that I don't like, I don't control how you get the notifications and all. I have no say in that and YouTube can just suggest the, this live stream to anyone they want and I have no, no way to control that or to just, unless actually I can, I can pay them to sort of promote um, and show this to like just a, like an ad 
but it is, I'm not going to pay for... I don't even know if you can do that with live streams. I can do that with a video if I want. So basically have a video as an ad. But it's just useless. So I, other than that, I have no way of promoting my stream. I can promote on other platforms, but on YouTube, I have no way of... Um, making sure that anybody who would be interested knows that I'm alive. It appears as video and we must click on, uh, well, get notified. Bell on notification, yeah. That's the best way because if with the bell icon Notification you receive the yeah, you get wherever you ha you are you can you get this on your phone. So yeah It's the best way. So maybe I should promote that on my uh, I should tell people who don't know basically That if they want to not miss one of the uh, one of the live sessions that they have to turn on the, the bell notification I think it's the safest way to like not miss one. It's not Google, it's YouTube. Yeah, well, Google owns YouTube, but still it's like just, well, a system within a system, but yeah. Yeah, so everybody here is has the bell, basically. So uh, yeah, so you are you are like the the, the top, <laughs> you're the, the all the best basically. But how can I have? How can I get the other people who didn't think about about hitting the bell notification? option how can i get to them that's the question because everybody's going to say hey i didn't know there was a live well i have no way of reaching out it's frustrating sometimes because i'm pretty sure that a lot of people would love to just know just be be just be notified but unless they have the bell basically it's like I'm just making a stream just for those who have the bell turned on because YouTube is not necessarily going to show it like even like subscribing the, the subscriber thing it used to be a big deal back in the days but like Right now, from most of my subscribers, I'm pretty sure that they don't receive any notification or suggestion from YouTube. Pour tes ombres, utilise plutôt du noir pur si elle est très forte, et si oui, plutôt noir d'ivoire ou noir de Mars. Dans tous les cas, j'utilise toujours un mélange pour mon noir. Et euh, quitte à choisir, euh, ce sera plutôt euh, du noir de n'importe. Franchement, euh, mais j'utilise vraiment un mélange. Yeah, Twitch. Switching to Twitch would be um, would be a thing. I don't know. I've tried back in the day. I've tried, um, but it was very hard to move everyone there nobody followed basically so i i just i was just streaming in the void like alone yeah i need to push bell notifications on my shows An email sign up. Yep.
<laughs> it's hard for humans in the techni technological age to make any connection. In a way, yeah. Or it's so ultra connected that we are diluted, like our the attention that we can devote to other human beings is so diluted that we act less humans like less as humans and more like yeah as machine ourselves basically it says live in red on the bottom right hand corner I speak French English. <laughs> Have a giveaway and get email addresses. <laughs> yeah, it's a good idea. Give away what though? Maybe I should, I could reach out to friends and not for me, but like for you guys, like have giveaways that could be cool. I don't know, artistic brands, they're not really, they're not really for that. I don't know, maybe they get what they need. They don't reach out that much. I do receive a lot of offers from like like cheap Chinese tablets. They offer me to review the tablets. They were offer me to just or pay me to do a, a sponsored ad. Never do that though. Because it's like borderline scammy products. So, but I've never been really contacted by a, a like a decent brand that could allow me to do just good giveaways. So, sorry, not famous enough. Too bad for you guys. You don't get the free stuff. Okay, Stefan, I get YouTube notifications when you or other artists I, or I follow or live have the same, same setup for Instagram. Just fun to get something free. <laughs> yeah, I agree.
man, Felicia, I need to hire you for my uh, marketing team. You have so many cool ideas. I don't know, I've never been really interested in making merch like that, but I know that a lot of uh, people do that on YouTube. I know it would work, I know people would want it. It's just that I never really bothered you know, making t shirts and all. Retired. Oh. Bad luck for me. What did you what did you do before you retire? everything except sell shoes well that's what I should do sell shoes the Florent Farge shoes exclusively if you have the bell notification turned on Selling shoes is too Al Bundy. I don't get the reference. I know who Al Bundy is, but I don't have the reference of, uh, was he selling shoes? Was he his uh, profession? I don't remember this, this show. Like I, I, I know how, what it was. It was pretty funny, but I don't have any memories used to air when I was kind of young and I didn't just get it at the time. 
I never, never really caught up. Yeah, I know what show it is, Married with Children. Yeah, yeah. but I never really, I, I never really, I, know, I don't know this show by heart, that's for sure. I know kind of the name of, of uh, the guy and that's about it. Okay, so he was a shoe salesman. And Jasmine as well, he sold shoes. No, I prefer Al Bundy to the other to the other one. Yeah, definitely. Rabbit skin shoe is disgusting, but I, I don't know. It, I'm pretty sure it might exist somehow. Like rabbit skin shoes. I'm pretty sure it must be a thing. I don't want to know about it, but I'm pretty sure that it might be a thing. I feel your pain, Felicia, working at Walmart.
Man, now I have the, the stupid song of Married with Children in, in my head. <laughs> never thought, of, n never could have imagined this <laughs> before I, I hit go live, but you continue to amaze me every day so now <laughs> now this is my life for the next like 20 hours 24 hours i'm gonna have this stupid song stuck in my head and if you know what i'm talking about i'm not going to commit to to commit to singing it to you but if you know what I'm talking about I'm pretty sure that just me saying that will be enough to to engrave the sound the, the song in your brain <laughs> so sorry yeah well it's your fault actually makes me want to watch the show again but I, I guess it's pretty old now I, I'm pretty sure it's I don't know if it's aged well <laughs> pretty sure it didn't that much think of an another song well easy to say <laughs> easy to say because the only way to get rid of a, an annoying sound an annoying song in your head is to think about another song that's even more annoying what what would you say is the like the a more annoying song that I can have in my head like freed from desire you know na 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 uh, what else what's the most like dreadful song to stuck in someone's head like your worst enemy what song would you suggest Um, Alleluia? Oh, Barbie girl. Oh my god, no! <laughs> That's torture. No. Yeah, well, you know, it's a hit song when just evoking the name is enough to immediately burn it into your brain. Oh, you know what stupid song, but it's an old one. It was back when I was in like. I don't know, middle, junior high. It was Daddy DJ. This song was pretty awful as well. What else? It's a small world. Oh no! Oh my god. Oh come on. Some Brahms, yeah, but Brahms doesn't like get stuck in your head. It's like, you know, these stupid melodies that they have, like so stupidly simple songs. Oh, the crazy frog. Oh yeah, no, this one, this Beyonce one never really stuck in my head. I don't know about you, but this Beyonce one never really got me because I don't know like the lyrics are maybe t not not um, simple enough for me to just get in tune with the song I, I can't just mumble blumble it easily enough so it doesn't stick for me at least Oh, Gangnam Style. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I also have um, um, every time we touch, because every time we touch, I feel the na -na. Uh, This one is, is good as well. There's been a, a cover by uh, Electric Cold Boy recently. It's actually a great, great cover. I'm not gonna lie. The worst are in those where you only know the chorus and don't remember anything else. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you only know the na 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 na. <sighs> uh, Baby Shark never stuck in my head. I, it's the most annoying song that I know, definitely. But good for me, it never got me. This one never caught me, I don't know. I don't know how, like some songs work better than others. Don't know exactly how to explain it. I never, you know, I never realized at some point that was subconsciously singing Baby Shark. It never really happened to me. So I consider myself lucky in this regards. But it's definitely, uh, it's definitely one of the most annoying. Hi, first time caller. We're making a list of the most annoyingly sticky songs that get stuck in your head. So if you have suggestions. Oh, that song called Blue. Yeah. I'm blue. Da da -de da da da. <laughs> oh, this one was good. Like when you don't even need to write lyrics because you have la da di da da da. That Capybara song? What is it? Oh, Scatman! <laughs> yeah, see you, Adnan. See you next time. Yeah, who let the dogs out? Oh no. This is definitely one of the most annoying. Oh, this is definitely annoying. Just thinking about it is like making me tense. <laughs> Just like I'm... Uh, uh, these songs. But you have to agree that they did something right. Annoying or not, they did something right because... 
it worked whatever they they did when they came up with the song it worked cotton eye joe yeah Capybara song is something like probably a TikTok meme. Yeah, I'm not enough on TikTok to know that. I'm never on TikTok, so I, I don't know. Wouldn't know that. But I, I only see TikTok because of YouTube trying to push the TikTok content on, on this platform. And people just re-upload their TikToks on YouTube Shorts. But yeah. Never, never had this uh, this song on there. Wasn't me. Na, 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 na. Wasn't me. Na, 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 na. The Batman theme from the 60s. What is this one? Is this uh, is this the one that goes ta -na 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 -na. or is it the other one? I'm not sure. But yeah, copyright strike. Oh yeah, because my singing is that good. Definitely risking the copyright strikes just by the, the sheer singing talent that you see here. It's a multi-talented stream, you guys. I'm not just a painter. You can also sing the most glorious songs that you suggested. We could make a, a karaoke song, karaoke stream. I'm pretty sure it exists. Pretty sure you have someone karaoke-ing like live right now. Maybe in Japan, Korea. Well, we could do that if, if it's what you need, if it's what you want. Kidding, of course, but Art and music, what could be better? Exactly. The only problem is like, 
me singing a cappella from karaoke suggestions of the most annoying songs. I think some things could go better. Not the best idea if you if you want to keep your ears. <laughs> well, anyhow, no, I'm I'm not a I'm not a terrible singer. I don't mind singing. I I, I like singing. I never really actually learn how to you know properly sing and all, but. I'm not, I'm not good at singing, I'm not bad, I'm, you know, untrained, just normal singing ability, normal singing skills, like good enough for a karaoke night. Could you tell how your journey with painting started? Um, sure, it started. It, it's it was a conflictual uh, process at first when I first started, like as a student, because I was torn apart between philosophy and art, and I chose philosophy because the studying philosophy was free, like in in the free university. I could get my degree for free, whereas the art school was, I had to sort of pay, plus the the art institutions were mostly like contemporary and modern. So I didn't, didn't want to pay for education on like modern kind of stuff that I didn't feel any connection to. So I studied philosophy and I worked and I got a job and all. And then I came back to art after a sort of a, what, five or six years hiatus, or maybe more, 10 years if you count all things. So I came back and I decided to dedicate the rest of my life to art, but progressively. So started working half time, then um, like uh, first, no, 75% of my time, so I got, I was lucky enough to be um, able to be in a position to negotiate that because I was uh, I was working as a teacher, so I could do that. I, not everywhere is it's not a possibility for everyone, but I could, so I started like that. So first 75% uh, day job and like the rest would be de dedicated to my painting, learning the skills and all. Then progressively 50% and then 100% but with an option, sort of an option to keep my job. I was, I kind of went on a, a sabbatical, so to say. And then, in the end, uh, just become full time and progressively by making uh, efforts to always make it sustainable so that I can still um, contribute to the well being of my family and all. So that's how I did. The most annoying instrument would be the bagpipes. I don't know, I don't mind the bagpipes. If it's played well, I like it. Um, I don't know how to play it, so if I 
if if I had to play the bagpipe myself during a live stream, that would be very hard on your ears because yeah. <laughs> I guess if my son, my son is four, and if, if he ever says, "Daddy, I want to learn the bagpipes," or I would like. Uh, uh, say son, I don't want to interfere with your Creativity and willingness to learn but Please go learn somewhere far from the house <laughs> Because I'm pretty sure that once when the kid is learning the bagpipes It must be horrible For everyone in in the neighborhood But once it's played well, I don't, I don't, I don't mind. It's a nice instrument. It's so, so unique. I think the problem with the bagpipes is the. I don't know. Like usually, when when I hear about it, it's always the same songs that you hear. Like it doesn't seem that they are, they have a lot of, uh, but maybe I'm not well versed enough in bagpipe. By bagpipe music. But it's a super interesting instrument. Why have been why have we been so blessed by so many live streams lately? Yeah, twice a week. Believe me, I'm not complaining. I know. It's great. It's the new schedule. It's I'm making less tutorials or tutorials less often, but more um, more interactive basically. So the next tutorial is going to come out next week. And actually I've done the, um, most of it during a live stream and I'm going to re repurpose the content using um, suggestions and feedback so it's going to be the new thing basically spend more time with uh, with you interact more and do the videos just less regularly but make them uh, more valuable more interactive in a way because it's fun and i'm using this live stream moment as well for you know i'm painting my paintings and just talking at the same time but just note that there's not going to be streaming tomorrow. So it's not, I'm changing the schedule just a little bit. Thank you, Mags. C'est cool, je mets tes live, merci. Yeah, everyone, remember to leave a like because YouTube are YouTube overlords. They need to know that you guys like it. They don't trust, like, uh, they don't trust your written words. They want to have proof with a like. And it helps me in return because when more people like my videos they sort of 
take me more seriously and show it and suggest it to more people. This way a lot more people are notified when I go live. Otherwise, uh, YouTube keeps me in, in the darkness. I saw corn once live and they used bagpipes at one point. That sounds awesome. Would love to be here. Not the not a huge corn fan because I don't I don't know when they were kind of trendy back then when I was a little bit too young to follow the trend. I was not ready for new metal. And now that I'm into metal, I'm I'm not like really interested in the sound anymore. So I'm not I'm not really vibing with Korn. They're definitely a legacy band, in my opinion. Like I see them as a legacy band, but I don't, I don't necessarily listen to them. That's what I mean. Sometimes darkness is good, the light is brighter in there. Qu'est-ce que tu penses du concept de location de toile? Euh, ah oui, c'est une bonne idée, je trouve. Dans les, tu veux dire dans les médiathèques, oui prête ou loue des toiles à des gens des toiles d'artistes je trouve ça bien il faut que tu expliques exactement ce que tu ce que entends parce que je suis pas sûr qu'on parle de la même chose Jasmine Ouais, pour moi c'est ça ouais c'est ce que je pensais Oui, c'est ce que je pense aussi à euh, Keshelen, mais je ne suis, suis pas sûr que ce soit ce, ce dont elle parlait, je ne sais pas.
Bah, moi, j'avais pas entendu ce système. La plupart du temps, euh, les artothèques que je connaissais, c'était des fonds publics, en fait. Genre une commune qui va euh, acheter euh, des œuvres et puis les prêter. C'est un peu comme une bibliothèque, quoi. Avec de l'art. Et c'était pas pour faire de l'argent, pour le coup. Quand c'est public, techniquement, non, parce que ça permet à des artistes de, de gagner un petit quelque chose et puis ça leur ça valorise le travail. En effet, si c'est privé, pour le coup, je vois pas trop l'intérêt, en effet. Je, comprends, je connais pas, en fait, le système dont tu parles. Bah ça, il y a des galeries qui le font déjà par défaut, genre, mais en fait, c'est l'œuvre qu'ils exposent, ils proposent aux gens de le, de le prêter, quoi, ou ils mettent le, le tableau à laisser. Ça peut arriver, certaines galeries le font, ça. Mais je pense que c'est différent, l'idée que... Donc, parle Jasmine. Un leasing, ouais, c'est ça. Ça peut être ça, mais... How can a straight line on a sketchbook, on a sketch, look like a smirk? What am I doing wrong? Well, this a smile is... It is... You're not doing anything wrong. It's like a smile is something extremely complex. Like, it's no surprise that, like, the famous Mona Lisa smile is still, you know, It's, it's not a smile, first of all, and it's still captivating people, even though it's not even a smile, so yeah. It's tricky. It's very, it's, it's super complex. Like we communicate so much with just smiles.
Ouais, alors là, j'en sais rien du tout, euh, les amis, euh, sur ça. Est-ce que c'est une violation du droit d'auteur oh, C'est quelque chose que j'ai pas trop... Euh... J'ai mieux pensé à ça. Un peu une zone grise, je dirais, mais ouais. Ça peut se faire, c'est possible. Alors, la plupart des gens qui achètent de l'art veulent voir la valeur monter, donc je vois pas en quoi la location serait intéressante pour les, les locataires, quoi. Hi Dave, good evening from Edinburgh. I find it difficult to paint faces and expressions on small figures. Could you give me an advice, please? Regards, Dave. So first of all, small figures is difficult. So, yeah, um, if possible, try to have like a face that's approximately the size of the palm of your hand, if you can, because it's the the optimal head size for a painting. It, it works better. It's like more pleasant to look at and and also better to paint for you as the artist. And other than that, just take something very fine and, and small, very uh, like a small fine brush, small round. Try to be as uh, as precise as you can. But it's going to always be tricky. The smaller you go, the more it becomes an art of its own, like a miniature almost. Ah, je pense pas que ça puisse se jouer à ça, Jasmine, à mon avis. Je pense pas que ça fasse une grosse différence. Mais bon, à voir quoi. Alright, everyone, I think I'm gonna leave you on this note. I'm going to um, say goodbye now. So thank you very much for, hello, I'm here. Thank you very much for sticking with me for this long. I'll, I hope you have a wonderful evening, night, morning, wherever, whatever time it is where you are. I'll see you for the next one and take care. Love you guys, bye.